We've put together this video to show how complex the business of policing has become. It's called Anatomy of an Investigation and chronicles the homicide investigation of Jazpreet Jazzy Rahal. This 30-minute production highlights the teamwork and collaboration that occurs from first response through to court conviction and how important everyone's role is in the process. It shows how many units and personnel are involved in investigations of this magnitude, how important central coordination must be, such as that provided by the RTOC, and the significant time commitment and cost that all factor into a successful conclusion. When you have time, I encourage you to watch it. Remember that we dispatch over a quarter of a million calls a year. This video is about one call on one night that leads to a single investigation. Calgary Police Emergency. Can you confirm the location, please? I show here, Northland Village Shops. And what's happened there? Someone's been shot? I heard some numerous, what I, what I thought were, were gunshots. I heard between eight and 10 shots. And I stood there for five or six minutes, just waiting and watching and uh, wondering what that was. I witnessed a black Ford probe down by Gold's Gym that was creeping along uh, the back alley and its lights were off. I walked probably about 20 paces down towards Gold's Gym where I heard the noise from. And one of my first thoughts was, what's going on? About 23, 24 paces, I walked through an actual cloud of gunpowder and I finally come around all the vehicles and I see this individual I, I knelt down to, to see if he was breathing or anything and he wasn't breathing my name is Mark Ron uh, I was the first responder on scene along with my partner uh, we maintained continuity of the inner scene and the body and waited for other resources. 1301. We're going to need a couple more cars to the scene here. When I first arrived, shortly thereafter, there were at least the eight other zone units that did containment, outer containment around uh, this area. Canine was here. Our full crime scenes unit was here. I'm Sergeant Jim Edwards with the uh, Forensic Crime Scene Unit. Uh, our duties include attending crime scenes and processing the scenes for exhibits and then examining those exhibits for any uh, forensic evidence. I believe there were six officers doing continuity when we arrived to make sure that no one has access to the crime scene. Now that's six uniformed personnel uh, in, in a vehicle at certain points, specific points, to prohibit anyone from entering the scene uh, and potentially damaging or removing evidence. From exhibits seized at the scene, in particular the shell casings, we were able to determine how many shells we were, were believed fired, what type of firearm was used, uh, the caliber and the type of gun used, and the number of shots fired uh, during the, uh, the incident. Unlike the television programs where everything is done in approximately an hour, our investigation can, can take um, several days, weeks, and, and actually months, again, depending on the scope of the investigation. Uh, these things don't happen that quick. And when we process scenes and or other exhibits or other secondary scenes, we want to be as thorough as possible and gather as much evidence. 
my name is Sergeant Troy Rudy. Uh, back in January 2005, I was a tactical flight officer in the Air Services Unit. We arrived approximately two minutes after the call came in. First ones at the scene, and I wanted to capture exactly what we were seeing at the time for investigators later. Uh, that night, my focus was to look for any discarded evidence, shell casings, uh, weapon, uh, vehicles that were in and around the scene. It was just after mall closing, so we were obviously looking for vehicles that looked out of place or any type of vehicles that were fleeing from the area. My name is Staff Sergeant Patty McCallum. And your name is? The uh, Jazzy Ray Hall homicide was the first case I had when I was in the homicide unit. And I uh, carried that file with me for four years. Whenever a homicide comes in, your first few days are probably the most important and the busiest as an investigator. So when we talk about the first 72 hours, scene processing is important. We're looking at the body in the environment of this parking lot. We're looking at keys, cell phone, vehicle he came in. Those things will give us a clue as to who he is, leading to the tentative idea of that subject. The autopsy is important because it confirms identity. Once you confirm the identity, and in this case, uh, Mr. Jazpreet Rayal, Jazzy for short, we were able to confirm his identity and that opened the doors to the investigation. Other than make some inquiries at that gym. Investigators generally don't get a lot of sleep the first night. They'll go a full 24 or full two days without sleep and then generally they try to get sleep on that uh, third day. Walking all over each other. 13 6 5, I copied you. My name is Trish Pace. I'm an analyst with Calgary Police Service. I'm currently assigned to homicide and robbery. My role is to assist the investigators as they move through the investigation with putting together some of the information and tying some of the people, the places, the things together. I was called out in the middle of the night and I don't believe I left work until the end of the day the next day. So something like this, especially a shooting where you've got a lot of criminal ties and a lot of things to be checking, you can be at, at work for up to 20 hours straight before you head home. When we had that confirmation that it was Jazzy that was most likely lying deceased on the ground, at that point, I was able to take that information and start looking through our computer databases and everything I have access to, to look at building what we call a victimology or a victim profile. It was a bit of a kettle of fish when I started looking into his profile because he had his fingers in everything. Uh, we had information on our database that he had ties into mortgage frauds. We had information that he may have been involved in drugs. We had information that tied him into various organized crime groups, not just one. Investigations with uh, organized crime are very hard to uh, investigate, um, especially from an intel point of view. A lot of my job is dealing with sources and informants. Hey, how's it going? To get people to actually talk about organized crime is uh, difficult because it's the fear of uh, uh, repercussions and reprisal that uh, um, their life's in danger, so we have to be able to convince them that uh, um, what they're doing is, is proper. Things are a little tense out there. We would meet them in various locations, um, whether it would be in hotel rooms, in a vehicle, in a farmer's field. We'd meet in various different uh, locations to keep uh, their identity um, safe. And the information that was provided to us is very, very important. You have a number of different avenues in which that information can arrive. And so all of that information has to be explored and examined. Okay. Just got to get some information from you first, okay? Your name is uh, Harris. Each of those witnesses can be at least an hour. So that's a lot of time and note taking and transcribe of interviews. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of people to do it.
when you're dealing with sources, it's a 24-7, 365 thing. If there's something comes up at three o'clock in the morning, they have to get hold of you. You're answering the phone, you're dealing with them, you're dealing with their issues at the time. Because if you don't answer your phone, then uh, they stop calling you and they, they feel that they can't reach you, you're not trustworthy, and they're gonna go and uh, not provide the information. You know, so the amount of work is incredible. All these witnesses then provide information that will suggest that we check out this person, that person. So from all those people, we were able to get a much smaller group of people that we could work with. Nine people is still a lot of people to be working with, so it took a long time. He's through 34th, he's going to be held at Ruby's at uh, 36th Street. So that's why you're now calling in the experts from uh, Strike Force Unit. We utilized um, the Target Enforcement Unit. Uh, I see, I see 63, 66. So it's be now you're starting to um, have surveillance on each of these nine people. And now you have to do pretty much the same thing you did with Mr. Ray Hall, you do with all these nine targets. You want to find out where they work, where do they live, who do they associate with, what are they doing, what crimes are they involved with. So now you start to, to profile each one of those nine and see how they may fit into this homicide. Do they or don't they? So you need to eliminate, and if they're not eliminated, they go forward. Fuck, buddy. Should have been out last night. Yeah, what happened? I got no fucking awesome fight, man. Oh, nice. Fuck, I fought some fucking little I'm a detective in the Targeted Enforcement Unit. Targeted Enforcement is a covert unit responsible for investigating or organized crime figures, the roles that they play. In Overdue, I was uh, one of the investigators assigned to surveillance and uh, intercepting private communications. I would spend time in our covert intercept room. Um, reviewing calls or information that came through on the investigation. That's killer, buddy. That's super killer, man. He's probably going to want to come back and kill me, though. I'm Dick Ninehouse. Back in 2005, I was the staff sergeant of the Electronic Surveillance Unit. It's very resource intensive to conduct a wiretap because we have to listen to all the communications as they're coming in. So that takes a lot of people to do 24-7 um, and we could be listening to upwards of 48 conversations at a time. The covert investigator, as myself, we would then review those calls uh, as they're coming in, ensure that um, if there's something that's actionable, that is action right now. Um, in organized crime investigations, everything is dynamic, it moves very quickly, so you don't have the luxury of waiting and reviewing it during traditional hours. So, you know, you may be working 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 o'clock, depending on when meets are going to be met or had, you'd have to be there to, to really review what's going on. The investigators have a theory of the crime and how it evolved. Surveillance can either prove or disprove that this person is involved or somebody's not involved. When you're getting into the organized crime, we have so much information on them and trying to sift through and figure out what's significant is really time consuming. I see these investigators that I work with, they work unbelievable hours and unbelievable personal sacrifice. And it's reflected in our clearance rates. We're sitting at 80%, we're sitting at 85%. This year is pushing 90%. It's because of what they do and the effort that everybody as a team puts in. There was times like the night of the, the Ray Hall homicide, I had to get out of bed and come into work. There's other nights that you have to phone and cancel plans because there's something on the go that needs to be done for the next day. There's weekends that you have to come in to get stuff done. So it's a trade-off. Yes, this is interesting, but you, you understand coming in here that there is a sacrifice for your personal life. I'm a detective with the Calgary Police Service. I'm currently assigned to the homicide unit. Back in 2005, uh, 
uh, I was assigned to the Priority Crimes Unit, a unit that focuses primarily on uh, undercover homicide investigations. Uh, my role in the, in the investigation was as the primary undercover operator. Uh, I was to seek out Justin Anderson, who'd been identified as a person of interest, and attempt to befriend him with the hopes of receiving information from him. I spent uh, a considerable amount of time with Anderson and built uh, a significant friendship and bond with him. Basically, you're, you're trying to get them to tell you their, their deepest, darkest secrets, so your bond is gonna have to be substantial. Commitment-wise, uh, it's a huge commitment. I mean, it's, it, it basically becomes your life. Uh, Mr. Anderson and I, I'm sure if you would have asked him the day before he was arrested, he would have told you that I was his best friend. Uh, and it takes a lot of commitment and a lot of time uh, to develop a relationship like that. Um, again, I said it was a nine-month uh, operation, so very close to a year, and uh, your life is, in essence, as you know it, on hold. very logical explanations for why that happens and that is that if you're going to develop a relationship with somebody it's like a friendship. Um, if you had a girlfriend or a husband or anything like that you, would, you wouldn't just see them between the hours of 9 to 5 obviously. Um, if it's 2 o'clock in the morning and I'm in bed and the phone rings and my target is in trouble or needs help or wants to meet, uh, my, myself and my team will get out of bed at 2 in the morning and we'll go to work. Oh. Yeah, I'll be right there. You, you are ingrained in a role, and you have to become that role whether you're at work or not at work, and uh, your safety depends on it. They pulled the UCs and stuff are in place. Um, I'll get back to you once uh, Anderson shows up. My responsibility was to monitor what was going on in the undercover part, pass that information on to the investigators, ensuring that there's timely communication. One of the things we found as investigations evolved, especially in organized crime, as quickly as you can get the information to the investigators for assessments to be made as to strategies, tactics, where we go from here, it really impacts or affects how, the, how successful you can be in the investigation. It really kind of secures your, your belief that this person had involvement. Over and above that, Mr. Anderson also told me about a homicide uh, that he was involved with that took place in Kelowna. Planning of the offense. And I just, you know, leaned out and did it. I just unloaded it. Um, he kind of stumbled a little bit, zigzagged, fell, and that was the end. I remember one time, uh, very vividly, Mr. Anderson and myself were in a hotel room. He turned to me and he said, you know, it was a really, really cold day out that day. And as, as we drove away, I looked out my window and I looked back at uh, Mr. Ray Hall. And Mr. Ray Hall was laying on the ground. And uh, Mr. Anderson said, I'll never forget this. He says, as we drove away, he says, I could see steam rising from the bullet holes. Uh, so it's, it's, it's things like that that uh, really kind of secures your, your belief that this person had involvement. Over and above that, Mr. Anderson also told me about a homicide uh, that he was involved with that took place in Kelowna. The Joint Forces operation was at several levels. Uh, my involvement in the operation, of course, remained as the undercover operator. And uh, we went and we sought out the person uh, who we felt was responsible for the Kelowna homicide as well. Attack coffee, we're taking him down. K9, tighten up with uh, 16. Make sure you tighten them in case he runs. Take me out to the ground. Get your hands where you can see them. Get on the ground. 
A Calgary man is now charged with a gangland style slaying earlier this year. Kevin Green is following this story. He joins us live now from outside police headquarters. Kevin, who's charged and how did they find him? Police say a Calgary man named Joshua Fell, who also goes by the name of Justin Anderson, will be charged in Rahal's death. The disclosure component of an investigation is crucial because Every part of your investigation has to be packaged in a sense, it has to be um, scanned, all the documents are scanned, it's put on electronic format. Inside of all these boxes, we have various stages of the investigation. So we have, in the first 72 hours for example, we would have all the officers that attended, anyone who touched this file, would provide us with their notes and with what we call a will state. And it's just a summary of what they did in the investigation. We have um, crime scene evidence, we have forensic lab reports, we have the evidence itself, which are actually contained in other boxes. And we have the photographs, all those things. And then a large number of these boxes contain binders that have wire information, they have summaries, and we had in excess of 80,000 calls. All of those are packaged up. Hey, Dennis. My name is Dennis Charlebois. I work for Major Crimes in the Investigative Disclosure Unit. In this case, there is roughly 13 boxes of paper information that needed to be scanned. The electronic has to be put on to the drives. All the electronic information has to be converted because everything is that goes to the Crown has to be in a PDF document or format. So all Word documents, that sort of thing, emails and that sort of thing have to be created to PDF. Basically 13 boxes, we're estimating between 2,000 and 2,500 pieces of paper per box, so that times 13. But also after the uh, information is scanned in, all the documents have to be indexed. So that worked out to about 6,500 index documents that had to be typed in and put onto the system. Once that evidence went in, and of course the UCO component was a huge part of that, that made it such that there was really little challenge or no challenge left for it to go to trial, and that created a situation where the accused in this case, Mr. Anderson, pled guilty to first degree murder on the first day of, of the trial, which was supposed to last for about another month, five weeks. 